Welcome back. I'm Shane, and this is the Kaizen from Ikigai Watches, a brand new watch from a brand new micro brand, of which I probably just mispronounced. And this watch is just launched on Kickstarter. This is a watch that was designed to be more than just a simple instrument that tells time. It was designed to help tell a story, your story in fact, as it's supposed to help represent what really drives or motivates you, something that helps symbolizes your purpose in life. Or, at the very least, that's kind of what I got out what the company is trying to accomplish here, as they seem to be driven to incorporate the Japanese philosophy they are named after into sort of horological form. If that's even possible. I'm not quite sure I fully understand it. I still have a hard time with Akuna Matata. And that's probably too deep a topic that any of you really want to get into. But regardless of that, this is one of the most interesting compressor style watches I've seen in a long time. One look at its modern minimalist design, and I immediately agree to do the review. Now, before we really get into this, I do need to point out a couple of things. Uh, the first, that this is a prototype, so your standard Kickstarter prototype warning applies here. And lastly, that sponsor tag was up because they did offer to give me one of these when it's all said and done. Now, that said, let's dive into the Kaizen and see what we got. The case shape of the Kaizen is one of its most unusual features. It has this wider base at 42 millimeters, but then tapers as it goes upwards to just under 40 at the top of the bezel, which is kind of similar to the Seiko bottle cap, if you happen to remember that one, or more recently, the Matthew & Sons Irokanji. And the unusual K-shape is gonna affect how the watch wears as well. Now, visually, it's gonna have a presence more of a 40 millimeter, but when on the wrist, it's gonna feel more like a 42. Lug to lug is also a decent 49 millimeters here. It uses 22 millimeter straps, 200 meters of water resistance, your standard Seiko NH35A movement, as well as a flat sapphire with AR coating, and it's just over 100 grams with its leather strap. Which really doesn't sound like a lot, but you can definitely feel that weight when you pick it up. It has this really solid well made feel to it, and I can almost see a CNC machine just making this out of one thick piece of stainless steel. If there's one hiccup when it really comes to the specs here, it's going to be in total thickness, as this is a little thick. As it's sitting at 14 millimeters, and that is from the top of the crystal all the way to the back of the embossed case back. However, this was done on purpose just to give the case a little more emphasis. As you see, the name Kaizen, and hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, is Japanese for volcano, and that is one of the inspirations behind the design. And it would make a lot of sense to have a really short volcano. So this thing did need some height to it. And to be fair, a lot of the compressor style watches I've seen are a bit on the thicker side. I think the Bradner and the 1970 from Dan Henry are both thicker than this. Just like the dial, the design language for the case is very modern and minimalistic. There's no organically flowing curves, fancy beveled edges, or really any polished components of any kind on the case. It's just a combination of angular brush surfaces some of which are sharper than others. Then throw all this together and you get this sort of modern minimalist interpretation of a metal volcano, which is complete with that internal bezel as it has this gentle 45 degree slope and this sort of creates this internal crater that houses the pool of maroon sunburst lava. It's really cool looking, but it definitely has more of a tool watch aesthetic. Now to the right, you have the dueling crowns, which are both signed as well as loomed up for a really nice touch. And one thing that I always like to see on a watch like this is that each of the crowns have a different signature, and that helps to differentiate which crown is for the movement and which crown controls the bezel. Now, there are a couple things to talk about here with the crowns. First off, the way the case is designed as it tapers out to the back makes using these crowns a bit more difficult than some other watches, as the back of that case and the long angular crown guards just seem to get in the way, and especially when unscrewing the lower crown. You can still do it, you just really gotta get your fingertips in there to get a good grip. The other thing is that the crown for the bezel isn't screwed down. Now, this is something they're talking about changing, but so far no decisions have been made. And to be fair, I'd say about half of the compressor style watches I've seen don't have a screwed down crown for the bezel. And that includes some at much higher prices. So there's probably a much larger conversation here, and personally, I'm kind of mixed on it. I think the proper thing to do would be to have both crowns being screwed down, but I think it is much more convenient when the bezel isn't. I'm someone that frequently uses a timing bezel just for random things throughout the day, and when I do have a compressor style watch, 
I have found that when the crown is screwed down, I tend not to use it. Now, some of that may be just from sheer laziness, but part of it is also a concern about screwing up the crown long term. As it's not just unscrewing it just to set it, but you gotta screw it back in after that, then unscrew it to reset it when you're done. I don't think there's a wrong way here, but just be aware that this is how it is. Moving to the rear, we have one of the coolest aspects of the watch, and it's one of the coolest case backs I've ever seen. Where you have this oil-pressed engraving of a volcano, you also have the particulars, as well as a quote from each of the four different colorways of the series. Each of the different colorways is named after one of the four basic elements. You have blue for water, green for earth, orange bezel for fire, and this maroon one for air. Which, to kind of nitpick that, red really isn't the color I think of when I think of air. I think maybe white would have been a better choice. But I guess orange makes a little bit more sense for fire, and I think this dial looked just way too good to pass up. The dial itself is this very clean, simple sunburst maroon. There's nothing applied to it, and everything is just painted on in white. The design itself is a bit complex, as well as being very modern. The brand lists it as being very Tron-like, and as a sci-fi geek, that's pretty much the first thing I thought when I saw it. And this is a mini lightsaber if you're not sure. The little Millennium Falcon model is over there, but I can't quite reach it. Anyway, the design on the dial is basically two different patterns that alternate after each other. And this sort of splits the dial into quadrants. And then that's repeated with a corresponding pattern on the bezel. And it's this very unusual pattern that makes the watch very interesting and I think very cool. But this is also something that I think is gonna lose a lot of people. It's a clean and extremely visually interesting design. Yet it is one that comes with quite a learning curve, as there are no Arabics here. And this is especially true when you're trying to set the bezel, as you've got to stop for a second and think where you want to stop it. So if you're more of a traditionalist or someone who just hates a lack of symmetry, this is probably going to be a pass for you. But at the same time, this odd design choice is really what makes the watch what it is. And there is still some symmetry here, but it may not be symmetry you're used to. Also, one huge benefit of the design here is that this is the first time I've seen a compressor style watch that really integrates the bezel into something cohesive. Most of the time with the other watches, the bezel looks a little different and seems to act more as a frame surrounding the dial. And as a result, the dials always look a little smaller than they should, at least in proportion to the case size. Where here, the coloring and the geometry just line up perfectly and lets the bezel really act as an extension of the dial, which winds up giving the dial a larger presence that I think fits more proportionally into the size of the watch. And this is something I think that you should really take note of. Although there is one thing I have to nitpick about the bezel, but first we gotta talk about the loom and then we'll come back to the dial. This, this is just really cool. This Tron-like design really comes to life when the lights go out, and I think they did a fantastic job integrating the loom into the design. Where you have this dual color setup, with the dial and hands having a blue coloring and the bezel being green. And I think this is also something that's really going to help if you were to dive with it, as the green triangle at the 12 really stands out compared to the dial design. However, as cool as this thing is, the loom needs to be better. They did a great job with the hands as they stay lit longer than that of a Seiko diver, but the dial and the bezel do fade out quicker than I like. Which is really a shame, because this is one of the coolest aspects of the watch. However, the brand is aware of this, and they have said that they are going to improve loom on the dial. So right now I'd say the loom is okay, but if they were to come through with that, then I think it'd be good. They've also mentioned that they might loom the logo. Again, nothing's been decided, but that's also something I'd really encourage. But let's get back to the dial, and this again is another nitpick. Now, as you saw, the loom on the bezel is green, and while it doesn't have the longest lifespan, it does have a nice healthy glow to it. And this is apparent when you're looking at the watch at most times. And having a little bit of a green glow to the dial is something I usually do like. But here, you have a design that has that green tint to it, and it's lined up with the corresponding design on the dial that doesn't have any green to it. It just looks white. And it just throws it off a little bit. Now, there's nothing they can really do about it other than just completely altering the design, but it is something I've noticed. And again, this is just a minor nitpick. In terms of text on the dial, you have a very minimal amount on the bottom, as well as a nice sized logo at the top. Normally I'd say a logo of this size is just way too big and way too distracting, 
but I think the paper crane design does seem to fit with what they're doing here, and overall I am okay with it. Which leaves us with the hands to talk about, and they went with your standard lance-shaped hands for the hour and minute. Now, there are some things to nitpick here with the hands. I think the hour hand is a bit short, and overall I think they are a bit thin for the size of the dial. And while the white against the red backdrop does make them easy to make out, there's nothing here that really draws your eyes towards them. Now overall I think they're okay, but I think an unusual and visually interesting dial like this should have an equally unusual and visually interesting handset. Maybe something with an interesting geometric pattern, like the minute hand of the Zello Swordfish. Or maybe something a bit more skeletonized, like the Orient Star Diver. Or maybe something that's a combination of both. Although, to be fair, there's nothing wrong here with what they've done. And I could see them wanting to stick with a standard handset. That maybe they were concerned that they went too far with the dial and they wanted to maintain some sense of normalcy here. But personally, I just would have doubled down with the unusual and gone with something different. As for the movement, we have a standard Seiko NH35. It's pretty much the perfect choice for a watch at this price. Although, be aware that there is a ghost date here, and that's where the movement has a date feature, but it's covered up with a dateless dial. There's nothing wrong with it, but I do mention it because I know some people are bothered by that. Now, I'm not entirely sure what strap options are going to come with the watch, as they actually sent me two to check out. The first is a simple tropical rubber strap, and since it is hotter than hell here in Texas, that's what I've been using the most. Overall, it's a good tropic strap, but it is just kind of a generic tropic strap, so it's very usable, but nothing really noteworthy to talk about. The second was a pretty good classically styled leather strap. I believe the production model will have a logo on the buckle, but this one doesn't. Overall, it's just a good leather strap. I'm not really sure of its composition, but it does have quick release, and it does have a nice thickness while still having a soft and supple nature to it. It's sturdy, yet flexible enough that there's a minimal break-in period when you're wearing it. Overall, it's just a good strap, and I do have to compliment them on the color choice for the red dial. Picking a good strap for a red dial watch isn't always the easiest thing, and I think they did a good job here. It has this reddish hue to it which does match the dial, yet it's brown enough that it doesn't perfectly match and it does still have some contrast to it. Although, as you can see, changing the strap with this one really does change the look up a bit. And personally, I think my favorite combo was the Blue Shark textured Bond strap here. But regardless of what shoes you throw on this watch, it feels pretty good when you're wearing it. The wider base and the case back are a little flat, but overall it is pretty comfortable. Like the bottle cap and the Air Kanji, it also has a great and very unusual presence for its size. There really is nothing quite like them. Now, in terms of value, I think you are pretty good here, at least in terms of Kickstarter prices, which I think is going to start at about 290 and I think that's right in line with what the Spinnaker Bradner and the Dan Henry 1970 sell for. And those are probably two of the most popular compressor-style watches out there with a Seiko NH35A, so it's good competition to compare it to, and this watch is right in line with that. Now, just a few years ago, if you wanted a reasonably priced compressor style diver, you were pretty much limited to that Spinnaker Bradner or the Dan Henry 1970. But today, there are a lot more choices. And in particular, compressor style divers seem to be a thing with micro brands right now. I mean, heck, as of filming this right now, I actually have two other compressor style watches that came in the same time for review. One is from Mitch Mason, and one is a second hour giant stride. So there are plenty of choices out there right now. And I gotta say that out of all the ones I've seen, this is one that focuses the most on form over say function, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's kind of the whole point of this watch. It doesn't mean that it's not capable. It just means that there was more of an emphasis put on creating a unique design than say following a traditional design path. Which I think is one of the reasons that while doing this whole review, I kept thinking of the Matthew and Sons Irukandji. The Irukandji is definitely not the best diver out there, just like this one isn't the best compressor watch out there either. But the Irukandji was a watch that really did its own thing, and ultimately because of that, it was very, very memorable. I'm not even sure when I did that review, but it's still a watch that I think of today, as well as a Seiko bottle cap which has a similar case shape. And I think the Kaizen is going to fit right in line with that. 
So bottom line is that this is a very solid, well-made watch with a very interesting, if not different design, but it's one that's really gonna help it stand out in a crowd of other compressor style watches. And for me personally, that's one reason that I think it's gonna be one that I always think about and remember even years down the road. That doesn't necessarily mean it's one you need to go out and buy, but if this is something that you're interested in and you like the design, it is one that you should go check out. The only question that I still have left is just how this watch is going to do with its Kickstarter. I really don't know, but that's something you can help me with down below. So let me know what you think about this one in a comment, and especially if you like the design or if you think they went too far and it's just a little weird. Or maybe if you think they didn't go far enough, let me know that as well. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time. See you next time.